I want to welcome you to the Vine. My name is Jonathan, and I hope that you're blessed by our time together today. In just a moment, you're going to hear our musical selection, and then you're going to hear our gospel lesson this week from the Gospel of Luke and how Jesus journeyed with two disciples to a little village called Emmaus. But before we do that, I want to say that there's absolutely nothing that I would love more than to get to know you. If you're watching us in another community or another state, I hope that you'll reach out to me. Send me a message. You can uh, send me a message through our church's Facebook page, or you can email me directly at jonathan.wvumc at gmail.com. If you live locally, you can message me as well, and maybe we can get together for a cup of coffee and get to know each other a little bit. I also want to encourage you to visit our church's website so that you can see different ministry opportunities and ways that you can grow in your faith. And there's also a place there where you can partner with us in ministry through online giving. And we want to let you know that each and every time that you give, you help us in our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Before we go to this week's scripture lesson, I want to take just a moment to lift you to God in prayer. Merciful God, I thank you for your presence in our lives. I thank you for the mystery of resurrection, the mystery of holy communion, the mystery of Christ in our lives. And I pray for each and every person who's listening today that you will inspire each of us to trust in you, that you will open our eyes, that you'll warm our hearts, that we might see you in ordinary places. Help us, God, to be witnesses of your love and your grace in our lives. I pray for each person who's watching today that you would help us to be encouraged in our discipleship journey, that the things that are weighing us down, that we would be able to let go of them and trust them in your care. I pray for those who are hurting and lonely, those who are suffering, for those who are grieving. I pray that your spirit will give them comfort and peace and grace in their time of need. And in these moments, as we hear your word, may you stir deep in our hearts that we might hear your word anew, a fresh word for us today, so that we might be found faithful in your sight. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.
Amazing love, how oh, can it be That you, my king, would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true It's my joy to honor you Amazing love, how can it be That you, my king, would die for me Amazing love, I know it's true It's my joy to honor you In all I do, I honor you In all I do I honor you. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets has declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. When I was in college, I had a friend, or maybe more accurately, a protege, and to protect his identity, we'll call him Joe. Joe was a couple of years younger than me. And everyone thought that he was this really nice guy, but he was also extremely reserved. And I think because of that, most of his gifts and potential went largely unnoticed. 
Joe came from a family that had some challenges, and when he was a senior in high school, he had a falling out with his parents. And in this moment of, of heated discussion, they came to this mutual agreement that it was time for him to move out. And so initially, he went to live with a family from our home church. And that worked out for a while. He, he slept on a, an air mattress in their living room, but it, it wasn't a good long-term solution. And so they reached out to me to see if Joe could come and live with me and my two roommates. Now, everyone around us thought that this was a perfect idea because I was preparing to go into vocational ministry and Joe had expressed some interests, expressed that he was discerning a call into ministry. But he and I were almost exact opposite. Joe didn't have a whole lot of support, and I did. I had all kinds of support from my friends and my family. When I announced my call to ministry, everyone believed in me. They were behind me. They invested in me and gave me opportunities. And I think another difference is that from a young age, I was comfortable and confident to stand before a group of people and talk. And the same just can't be said for Joe. Joe had a kind of a soft, monotonous voice. He wasn't particularly dynamic. And he exhibited social anxiety just in one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And then the few times that he did speak up in a group setting, his face would turn blood red with embarrassment from drawing attention to himself. And he would have labored breathing. And he was clearly flustered. And on top of that, he was a, a larger young man with a limited income, and it was difficult for him to find clothes that fit him well. And so based just upon his appearance, people made assumptions about him. He just didn't look like he was really ever what we might call put together. And so everyone thought if Joe is going to go into ministry, he's going to need some help. The expectation was that I could kind of take him under my wing, that I could help him with some of these obvious challenges. And as a naive 20-year-old, I thought that I was kind of being a saint. I agreed to this whole setup. I saw it as a charity case. And unfortunately, I began to look at Joe as a project. At that time, I lived with two of my friends in a house. And we were typical college students. We were poor. We were working part-time jobs, trying to make ends meet while we went to school. And Joe fit right in. I mean, initially, he was pretty uncomfortable with the arrangement because he knew that we were kind of doing him a favor. He felt like he was a burden. He felt like he was imposing. But it didn't take long for us to catch onto his quick wit and great sense of humor. We also discovered that he was really intelligent. And it was right around the same time that I began working my first job in a church. I was 20 years old, and I was a part-time youth pastor. So Joe decided, hey, this is a, a fresh start for my entire life. I'm going to start going to church with Jonathan. And so he, he did. He came with me on Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, Wednesday nights, and he helped out with the children and youth ministry. And he was a total hit. Even though he was really quiet, it seemed like he was really able to come alive around children and youth, and they absolutely loved him. And Joe was also just an incredible servant. He was willing to do grunt work. He was willing to do anything and everything that I needed him to do. And one night, we were at home. It was pretty late. I was coming down the stairs, and I could hear Joe's voice. When I turned the corner, I saw him kneeling at the couch, and he was praying. And I heard him praying for me. Later, I found out that this was something that he did every night. And this was such an incredibly humbling experience in my life because I began to realize God hadn't just put me 
in Joe's life, God had put Joe in mine as well. I had to stop seeing him as a charity case. I had to stop seeing him as a project and start seeing him as a partner in ministry. It was really during the stretch of my journey in life that I thought that I had already learned a lot. You know, I was a sophomore in college after all. I had learned a lot. But it was through my experience with Joe that I discovered that I still had a lot to learn. I thought that God had put me into his life to teach him about pastoral ministry. I began to realize that through his quiet, humble presence, Joe was teaching me what it looked like to be like Jesus. Over the last few weeks, I've been thinking about how interesting it is that after his resurrection, Jesus' disciples have trouble recognizing him. In the Gospel of John, Mary confuses Jesus with a gardener. And in Luke's Gospel, Jesus travels incognito with two disciples for seven miles. They assume that he's just another pilgrim traveling back from Jerusalem after the Passover. And then last Sunday, in our follow-up on the Lenten study, we talked about how that in 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that Jesus is the rock that traveled with the Israelites through the wilderness. And in case you've forgotten this story or you're not familiar with it, Moses strikes a rock in the wilderness and water comes out. And so in other words, the rock becomes this unsuspecting source of life in a dry and weary land. And however we might construe Paul's words, his point is that Christ is always with us, even when we don't recognize him. In fact, Christ might be present with us in the last place that we would imagine and in his beautiful mysterious way he becomes an unsuspecting source of life in a dry and weary land it takes the average adult 15 to 20 minutes to walk a mile but i would imagine that it took cleopas and the other unnamed disciple a lot longer than that to walk to Emmaus. Jesus, their hopeful Messiah, has just been executed by the Romans. Their hope for a different kind of future has been crushed. And his death was a painful reminder that they would perpetually live beneath the weight of oppression. This event his crucifixion. It echoed the laments that we find in the Psalms and the woes of the prophets that the righteous suffer while the wicked seem to prosper. Where is justice? Where is God in all of this? And I think that at one point in time or another, all of us have been in the same place as Cleopas and the other disciple in this moment dragging their feet because they know that when they get back home, they've got to pick up all the pieces and try to put their reality back together. And in one word, we call this grief. And something that usually accompanies gr grief is this need for space so that we can process what's happened in our lives. In our lives. But in this story, as, as these two disciples are walking along, a stranger approaches them and asks them what they're talking about. And in a world where we've replaced front porches with privacy fence, this seems like an intrusion, an intrusion of privacy, right? It, it seems a little bit rude or annoying. And in our culture, we might be tempted to just say, none of your business what we're talking about or 
we might try to be a little bit more polite about it and just change the subject and say, oh, nothing, we're just talking about what happened over the weekend, and then we speed up our pace to lose our unwanted travel companion. And while we can imagine all of these potential responses, Luke tells us that these two disciples stood still. They stopped. They came to a halt. Because the weight of this conversation was just too heavy to continue walking and discuss it casually. Luke tells us that they stop and with downcast faces, they ask, Are you the only person in Jerusalem who's out of the loop? And I think to put this into perspective, it might be helpful to think about what was happening in America 55 years ago this month. Martin Luther King Jr. had just been assassinated a few days earlier. And so we might imagine what it would be like to walk in, into a predominantly African American community and see folks walking together somberly. We can imagine the response if we were to ask, well, what are you talking about? And their immediate response would be, well, what do you think we're talking about? What, what else is there to talk about? He spoke of a dream. He gave us hope, but that hope is gone and the dream has died. What might these two disciples assume immediately about Jesus based upon his question? I think that's probably safe to say that, that because he doesn't know what's happened, because they think that he's out of the loop, that maybe he's just not very interested in the welfare of his people. He's not in the same place as them. He's not experiencing and sharing their grief. And so they have this sense of social obligation to educate him and bring him up to speed. And of course, Luke tells us that they think that Jesus is a stranger. Their eyes are not opened. And I've got to say that I'm a curious person. I'm kind of like a three-year-old whenever it comes to reading the Bible. I, I read something and I say, why, 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 why is it like this? Because if I was Jesus, which thankfully I'm not, I think we go can all agree on that. If I was Jesus, I might be tempted to be a little bit more obvious on the day of my resurrection. Instead of approaching them from behind, I might suddenly appear in front of them in all of my splendor and glory so that they'd fall down at my feet and worship me. But that's not what Jesus does in this story. Jesus appears as a stranger, and he joins them on this seven-mile journey of kicking rocks on their way home. Instead of a glorious appearance, he joins them incognito. Instead of unloading answers, he asks them questions. He's with them while they're hurting. He's with them while they're processing, even when they don't realize it. And I think it's important for us to understand this entire story from beginning to end as divine revelation. Because once they get home and they break bread, their eyes are opened and they see and recognize Jesus as the resurrected Christ. But it's also in that moment that they realize that he's been with them all along. They say, weren't our hearts burning within us when he was walking on the road with us? You see, the two revelations correspond with one another. When their eyes are opened, Christ is not only revealed as the triumphant victor over the grave, but also he's revealed as the stranger who interrupts their conversation on the way. He's revealed as God incarnate, but he's also revealed as the unsuspecting presence, this unsuspecting source of life in a dry and weary land. 
Several years ago, I was trying to play catch up on a Saturday. I had had a particularly busy week and I had several things on my to-do list. And one of those things was to go and visit someone in the nursing home. Now, when I arrived, I pushed the door open and I began walking at a pretty fast pace. I knew exactly where I needed to go and who I needed to see. And as I turned a corner, I was walking down a hallway and I saw this woman sitting in a wheelchair over off to the side. But I kept walking past her. But then my brain kind of pieced together what I had actually seen. I stopped. Just came to a halt. I turned around and walked back towards her. And she was sitting there with one sock on her foot and one sock in her hand. And so I asked if she needed some help, but she didn't respond. I asked if she wanted to put the, the sock on her other foot. She didn't blink. She didn't nod. She didn't say yes or no. And so it became really clear that she could not communicate at all. And so I took the sock. It was one of those warm, fuzzy socks with the, the rubber grip on the bottom. And I knelt down and I put it on her feet. And it's difficult for me to explain. But in that moment, I experienced the presence of Christ in a more profound way than I ever had and have since. Uh, I looked up and I saw Christ in her. I heard the words of Jesus when he said, As often as you do it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Now, I realized that I wasn't really doing anything major to begin with. But in that moment, I knew that I needed her so much more than she needed me. That nursing home, it became, it became holy ground. I saw the resurrected Christ. My eyes were opened. And, and I realized that in some ways, this story is kind of strange, maybe. Maybe it's hard to relate to, but I think that's kind of the point. Because experiencing the resurrected Christ is probably not going to be the same thing twice. It's going to be different for each of us every time that we encounter him. The resurrection brings together the ordinary and the extraordinary. Sometimes we encounter Christ in a rock that provides a source of life in a dry and weary land. Sometimes we encounter Christ in a college freshman who's 5'10 and built like a linebacker with bright red hair. Sometimes we encounter Christ in a woman who sits silently in her wheelchair in a nursing home. Sometimes we encounter Christ in a stranger who interrupts our conversation on the street. But as Luke tells us, we always encounter Christ when we come to the table and partake of the bread and the cup. And as modern people, taking communion might feel a little bit superstitious if we're honest. I mean, it's juice and bread, right? But what's supposed to happen anyways? What what are we supposed to feel? What are we supposed to experience? But I think that each time we come to the table, we receive a divine revelation. We partake of ordinary elements, believing that in some mysterious way, Christ is not only spiritually present, but that the light of his glory and grace shines back on our week and gives us the opportunity to see where we may have encountered him in other places in unsuspecting ways. To see him in ordinary places 
and ordinary people. Now, my favorite part of the story is that after these two disciples realize who they have encountered, that they've encountered the resurrected Christ, they immediately begin their journey back to Jerusalem. And Luke tells us that it's already the end of the day. They've already traveled seven miles. And now at the drop of the hat, they're going back. It can't wait until morning. It can't wait another moment. Because they know that Christ was with them the entire way. They've got to go back and tell the others. And so whatever you face this week, I hope that you know that Christ has been with you every step of the way. May your eyes be opened. May your heart be warmed. And may you not waste another moment to go and tell others how you've witnessed his presence in your life. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for Jesus and his example of humility and love and service. I pray that you would open our eyes and warm our hearts, that we would see you in ordinary places, that the places that we walk each and every day would become holy ground. We also pray that others would see your love and your resurrection power in us. Lead us and guide us as we go about our week, that we wouldn't keep our stories to ourselves, that we would drop everything to go and share how we have encountered you and the life-giving love through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Until next time, take care and God bless.